Real Virginia is proudly produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation. Since 1926, Farm Bureau has been working to preserve Virginia farms and our rural heritage. Visit our website at vafb.com. and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce all of the wonderful products we enjoy, brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. A new study documents just how valuable cooperative extension and research is to Virginia. The best companions for vegetable plants might be flowers, and we take a close look at the farm economy of Washington County, Virginia. Welcome back everyone. We're coming to you from a beef cattle operation in Goochland County. And agriculture is the state's largest industry and many farmers will tell you they owe their success to Cooperative Extension. A new report shows that the work of several agencies not only impacts farmers, but all Virginians. Pressures from a growing population, health issues, and safe drinking water are just a few of the challenges facing Virginia farmers and consumers. Virginia Cooperative Extension and the researchers at the Virginia Agricultural Experiment Station have been focusing on solving these problems for decades. A new report from the Virginia Tech's Office of Economic Development shows that Agency 229, which provides funding to both Extension and the Experiment Station, has a huge and diverse impact touching every sector of Virginia's economy. We did our best to put a price tag on it, um, but uh, you're right, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a benefit to the state, really all parts of the state, um, and uh, yeah, just contributions to the economy overall critical contributions in a lot of jurisdictions on the producer side, um, but also, um, you know, making contributions to the state's, uh, the, 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 the bottom line balance sheet of the state's economy. The report said that Extension and the research station provide, quote, innovative, fundamental, and applied research, education and training, and direct assistance to Virginians has led to nationwide recognition of Virginia as a producer of superior agricultural products, better business management practices, and environmental stewardship that improves quality of life Life and attracts millions of tourists annually, end quote. Agriculture is the state's largest industry, and agriculture and forestry have a combined impact of more than $91 billion, the report said. We looked at um, um, programs, uh, including uh, some, some of the family and consumer services programs. Uh, we looked at uh, food and beverage product development. Uh, we looked at uh, beef cattle, poultry, and row crops. And so really got a, a flavor of uh, key programs in different parts of the state. The report also makes a number of recommendations on how increased state investment in the agency's infrastructure and programs would further increase its impact statewide. Their specific interest wasn't just for a study, but really to um, ask the Extension Service and the uh, research centers to, um, to document their contributions to innovation uh, in ag and forestry and to um, really project forward what was needed to continue to grow. There's great work going on, but there's more great work that we can be doing. We have vacant positions. Um, we have uh, great work going on at our extension centers, but some of them are just tremendously in need of modernization, uh, where their, you know, their equipment needs to be you know, brought up to, uh, to industry standards. From putting more money in the hands of cattle producers to coordinating more than 30,000 volunteers to run educational programs, the impact of Agency 229 funding touches every county and corner of the state. Eleven agricultural research and extension centers make up the Virginia Agricultural Extension Station, along with 107 Virginia Cooperative Extension offices across the state. They provide research-based information to the public to help their community flourish. To dig deeper into the Agency 229 study, visit agency229.cals.vt.edu. 
Virginia Tech operates agriculture research and extension centers across almost 4,300 acres of the Old Dominion. An additional ag research center is run by Cooperative Extension at Virginia State University. Scattered from Hampton Roads to Winchester to Southwest and Southside, Virginia, each of these centers conducts studies on crop varieties, production methods, livestock, and even seafood. Faculty at each center focus on challenges unique to agriculture in their region. These centers also serve as field laboratories for undergrad and graduate students, and producers, school groups, and other citizens use them for field day programs. Hi, today we're at the Gardener's Workshop Farm where we're going to be talking about planting flowers in your vegetable garden from the ground up. Please stay tuned. More than 90 years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made a promise to our local farmers to protect and preserve a way of life they'd worked so hard to establish. Today, our insurance agents work to protect all Virginians, not just farmers. Anyone can be a Farm Bureau member and enjoy the many benefits of membership. There's a local Farm Bureau in every county of the state. We think everyone should be a friend of the farm. Visit our website at VAFB.com to learn more. Did you know using flowers could boost your yields in your vegetable garden? Chris Mullins with Virginia Cooperative Extension visits one gardener who uses companion plants from the ground up. Hi, today we're at the Gardener's Workshop Farm in Newport News, Virginia, and we're here with owner Lisa Ziegler. Lisa, thank you for letting us come out today and, and talk about some of the things that you're doing here. Now, you're growing a lot of vegetables, but also a lot of flowers. Why would a gardener grow flowers in their vegetable garden? Any, any big benefits from doing that? There is actually, Chris. Um, we grow flowers so that we attract pollinators and beneficial insects, bumblebees and native bees to pollinate our vegetables, um, which is exactly what we need. Yeah, I can, I can see that because, you know, in the greenhouse when we grow things like tomatoes, for example, we'll pay money for bumblebees uh, to come in there and pollinate. So you're planting plants to actually bring those pollinators in. I guess that's the best it's, way of saying it's it. true yeah. and not only do we plant flowers we purposely have flowers available all throughout the season so there's always something to have them here we don't just want to attract them in and then let them leave we want them to come here set up housekeeping um, and live in our garden so that we can reap the benefits of pollination as well as beneficial bugs that eat the bad bugs because they come too so in nature there are there are natural enemies of a lot of the pests that we see on vegetable crops and so you're calling those beneficial insects correct uh, we call them the good bugs the right. good bugs are the bugs that eat the bad bugs that cause us problems and there's far more good bugs in a garden than there are bad bugs um, so if we just plant the flowers invite these guys in and then give them what they need to stay here nature takes its course and helps us to control they don't eliminate all of our problems, right. but they control it at a reasonable level. Sure, so you don't really spray any pesticides or anything like that? Correct, we don't use even organic pesticides here. Um, we don't find it necessary, and in fact, organic pesticides can harm pollinators and beneficial bugs, so we just don't risk it. Uh, it makes, makes sense. Now, we were talking before, and you've actually written a book on this very topic. What's it called? Um, Vegetables Love Flowers is the title, and you can learn more about it on my website, thegardenersworkshop.com, and um, it's all about how you can beef up your vegetable pest control um, by planting flowers. Let's go look at some of these flowers that you're talking about right now. Sure, I'd love to. Wow, Lisa, this is just beautiful. All these different colors uh, really makes an a great appearance in the vegetable garden. What are these? These are zinnias. Um, the most popular flower we grow for our customers as well as for pollinators and good bugs. Oh wow, love them. They look, they look great. And I like this one over here, these sunflowers. Now I've grown these before and I've put them in an arrangement and when you put them on the table or the somewhere, they always tend to get pollen all over the place. Do these do that also? They do not. Those are actually pollenless sunflowers. They still produce nectar for bees, okay. um, but removing the pollen factor makes them a better cut flower. They last longer and they don't litter your tabletop. Exactly. Now these are a little small. I've seen bigger ones. Do you grow them that way on purpose? Yes. Yeah, so that is the perfect bouquet size, a three to four inch bloom. And you control the size of a sunflower by how you space them in the garden. 
These are planted six inches apart in all directions okay. to create the size. 12 inches apart, they'd be this big. Oh wow, that is great. Now I, I, need, I see some other varieties out here. What are some other ones that you grow to help bring in these beneficials and pollinators? Sure. Um, so other great cut flowers that the pollinators and the beneficials love are coxcomb, cosmos, marigolds, and we grow a lot of um, black-eyed Susans, oh, yeah. different varieties, and the native bees really appreciate their presence. Oh, that is that is wonderful. Now you do this as a commercial operation, so you cut these and you'll have them put in bouquets or you'll sell them to people. The home gardener, they could do that I guess also, couldn't they? They could. Um, having a very small patch of zinnias in the backyard will produce a lot of flowers. And you just simply um, <clears throat> harvest them as soon as they get big and voluptuous like this and we actually remove all of the foliage because it makes the flower last longer. Oh, that is great. Wow, this has really been great today to come out and see all these flowers in the vegetable garden. Thanks for letting us do that. Hey, my pleasure, anytime. Well, for more information about growing flowers in the vegetable garden, please contact your local county extension office and talk to a master gardener. For From the Ground Up, I'm Chris Mullins. We'll see you next time. From the Ground Up is presented with the generous advice and assistance of Virginia Cooperative Extension. Visit their website at ext.vt.edu. It's soup season in the Old Dominion. Chef John Maxwell has a recipe for spinach and sweet potatoes that hits a spot in the heart of the home. Stay with us. Horses, food, and fun. They're all coming March 23rd to the 25th at the Virginia Horse Festival at Meadow Event Park. Experience three days of family-friendly activities for the horse lover in all of us. Shop vendors selling boots, barns, food, and trailers. New this year, children 12 and under are free. Visit the Chenery Collection of rare Meadow Stable memorabilia as we celebrate the birthday of Secretariat, America's most famous racehorse. Learn more at virginiahorsefestival.com or on Facebook on the Virginia Horse Festival page. Turns out spinach isn't just for salads. Chef Maxwell uses Virginia spinach with sweet potatoes for a hot soup to warm you up this winter in the heart of the home. Hi, welcome to the heart of the home. I'm Chef John Maxwell, and we're here at Meadow Hall, Meadow Event Park in Doswell, Virginia. Every week we get to play with some great Virginia food. We play with it in our kitchen so you can play with it in yours. Today we got some really wonderful stuff going on. We've got some great Virginia spinach, some sweet potatoes, some Portuguese chorizo sausage. Uh, it is a really good Portuguese or derived dish, but it, it is just popping with flavor. The first thing we're going to do is heat up our pan. That's going to get a little hot. We're going to add some olive oil to this, just a little bit. Now all we're doing is adding a little fat. You can add any kind of fat you want, really. You can use a little butter, you can use a little bacon grease, you can anything you want. But we're using olive oil here because it's got a neutral flavor. All right. That's hot. I'm going to add this sausage. All right. And this is a chorizo sausage from Portugal. And the difference is that this is not hot. This is a mild chorizo sausage. Um, the Spanish kind or the Mexican kind, South American kind is usually pretty spicy, but the Portuguese is not. So I'm going to add this. Yeah, you need to make sure your pot's hot enough for it to sing to you. And it's doing that. So, so roll that around. Now most of these sausages are already cooked, so we're really looking at just getting them hot all the way through. Yeah. I'm going to want to saute off some garlic and some onions in here, but I wanted to wait until the cold sausage going in there cooled off the bottom of the pot until it's back singing at me again so I can add the garlic and some onions. It's doing well, doing well. I can hear it going. Sure, you can too. Okay, while that's simmering down, we're getting ready to put the potatoes in, but I want to talk to you a little bit about spinach. Virginia has been famous for spinach all over the world, um, and it's, but it's hard to get it now. This is Savoy spinach. It's a triangular or arrowhead shaped spinach. It's wrinkly, really big, rich flavor. It's hard to find because nowadays people seem to be looking towards this baby spinach. It's very mild, doesn't have a lot of flavor to it, um, but it's green and it's good for you. Uh, but this is really special. And 
There are many restaurants in the last if they couldn't get Virginia spinach. Lou Chow's is one that comes to mind up in uh, New York City. Potatoes in there. Now we're going to add some chicken stock and let that come to a boil. All right, we got this is up to a boil now. I'm going to cut the heat down just a little bit. It's rolling really fast. All right. One of these days they're going to develop the technology so you can smell what's going on up here. This is just wonderful, rich, spicy. I'm getting ready to add the spinach. I've chopped up some spinach and in it's going to go. And once I put the spinach in, it's just going to take a couple of seconds for that spinach to wilt down and soften up a little bit. There it goes. Oh, it's just gorgeous. Let that simmer just a little bit. You have to be careful. Uh, the kind of sausage that you use is going to have a lot of effect on the, f the final flavor. You can use any sausage you want. Italian sausage, crumbly sausage, Spanish sausage, uh, breakfast sausage if you want. But it, um, make sure you take the skin off of it so that it crumbles up and goes into it unless it's a sausage like this or a salami or something that you're going to dice up. Uh, I like to use the Portuguese sausage because it's, it's smooth, it's rich in its flavor, but it's not real spicy. All right, so this is just about ready. <sighs> Very good. I tasted it. It doesn't need any salt, and it doesn't need any pepper this time. But the different ingredients are going to react a little bit differently, so sometimes uh, you might need a little salt or pepper. And this is... Portuguese chorizo, sweet potato, and spinach soup. It's wonderful. Join us next week on Heart of the Home, where we get to play with great Virginia food. Recipes from the Heart of the Home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at VAFB.com, as well as on Chef Maxwell's website at ChefJohnMaxwell.com. Commercial sweet potatoes are grown on 120 farms in the Old Dominion. The great majority of the crop is sold fresh instead of being sent off for processing. There's a long history of growing sweet potatoes in Virginia. By some accounts, they were first raised here as early as 1648. The Hayman sweet potato, an heirloom variety, thrives on Virginia's eastern shore. It's smaller than a traditional sweet potato and has a creamy white flesh instead of the typical orange. But locals swear by them. Sweet potatoes need hot weather to thrive, so gardeners and farmers wait till early summer to plant. You're going to need me. You're going to need us. All of us. You're going to need our help with your water. Your air. Your food. You're going to need our determination. Our compassion. You're going to need the next generation of leaders to face the challenges the future will bring. And we promise we'll be there when you need us. Don't let salmonella get funky with your chicken. On average, one in six Americans will get a foodborne illness this year. So learn the right temperature to cook each type of meat. Keep your family safe at foodsafety.gov. Named for General George Washington, Washington County was created in 1776 by the Virginia General Assembly. The town of Abington, the county seat, is a major transportation crossroads. Pioneers heading west took the Great Road through western Virginia, and Abington is where that route meets the main east-west road along southern Virginia. Today, Interstate 81 and U.S. Route 58 continue to be vital to the county's success. Nearby Bristol is the gateway into southwest Virginia from Tennessee, the historic Barter Theater is just one of a number of strong tourist attractions. Farming, timber, and salt production were early pillars of the county's economy. Today, tourism and agriculture remain vital. And right now, cattle is king. Washington County is the third largest source of cattle and calves in the state.
The beef industry's always been big in this area, and part of the reason for that, obviously, is the marketing, the marketing opportunities that you have in South in Abingdon uh, with Tri-State Livestock Market and the buying station here. There's lots of opportunities to market cattle as well as a lot of order buyers buying cattle out of the field. You know, here in Southwest Virginia, our hillsides grow, grow bluegrass. And in the summertime, our cattle gain good on that bluegrass. So we can take a, an animal and put several pounds on it and then sell them to the feedlots later on. Agriculture is a top economic driver in Washington County. There are 1,602 farms here, and cattle is the top farm commodity. Of the total $76.5 million in farm sales each year, $67.2 million come from cattle sales. Sheep, goats, and horses are the other principal livestock raised here. Tobacco sales add $1 million in farm income, and nursery and greenhouse sales generate another $947,000. Hay and forage are the top field crops, with 40,000 acres, and there are several Christmas tree operations. What's missing in recent years are dairy sales. Washington County used to be the third or fourth largest dairy county in Virginia. Now there are only a couple of dairy farms left. You know, can you sell your product the same price as it was 30, 40 years ago? And everything else has gone up. So that's been a tough, uh, tough, tough thing for the ones that's still in that business. And we still have a handful of dairy producers that, that have got, got larger. Uh, compared to a lot of the smaller dairy farms. Another major change was the end of the federal tobacco program more than a decade ago. Reynolds is one of the few growers left in the area. Washington County was the largest burl tobacco producing county in Virginia. Now we're very small. We have very few crops growing and most of it is under contract now. Uh, but burl tobacco supported several thousand farmers, farm families here in Washington County. It provided the income for them to live on, pay their taxes, and buy anything extra. Most Washington County farmers are part-time operators, but Blevin says he's encouraged by a few newcomers and experienced farmers taking advantage of the nationwide local foods movement. A lot of it's along the produce line, small-scale produce, selling at farmers markets and things like that. So there's been a big uptick in that in the last few years. The farmers market in Abingdon, for example, is... Uh, very popular in this area, as well as some of the local one, the smaller local ones in, in the other towns that are in Washington County. In addition to teaching agriculture at Patrick Henry High School in the county, Thayer owns a Century Farm and spends a large part of his time working to preserve farmland in the community. He's encouraged by the strong interest his students have in farming. I teach agriculture in high school and I've seen a, a big change in my 28 years of teaching. Uh, in relationship to that, we have fewer and fewer individuals coming from the farm, but they have their hands in a little bit of uh, mini farming with raising chickens, uh, vegetable production. Washington County farmers have had to adapt to major economic changes, but they are confident farming has a bright future in their community. Our schools do a lot of growing of gardens and crops and plants. Uh, our children get exposure in tours. Another thing that's happening is we have a number of farmers that are growing uh, uh, greenhouse crops or greenhouse plants and uh, organic farming. Is on, it's on a small scale, but we have very much organic farming here. And really the public, I think, has uh, come to recognize that agriculture is the largest industry in this county. And there's every reason to keep it in place, not only from the standpoint of the economy, or the ag economy, but from the standpoint of tourism and other things associated uh, with other things that go on in the county, it just makes the county more attractive. With the help of extension research and a friendly community, there's no doubt the farmers of Washington County will continue to thrive. In Washington County, Virginia, I'm Norm Hyde. That's going to do it for this edition of Real Virginia. We are so glad you could join us to celebrate the bounty Virginia has to offer. Whether it's in your home, your garden, or your landscape, we are proud to say that this is Real Virginia. So for everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching. Make it a good week. Chesapeake Bay.